Coming up on UCF Nightly News, Halloween is here and law, and law enforcement officials are giving tips on how to stay safe. Also, gas prices are dropping in Central Florida. Find out by how much and how long this will last. And a nurse struck with the Ebola, Ebola virus is now cleared. Find out what she has to say about her recovery and treatment. Nightly News starts now. Good afternoon and welcome to Nightly News. I'm Melissa Lujan. And I'm Paige Sterner. Today is Friday, October 31st. The midterm election is only four days away and students can expect to see many things on the ballot. The race for governor is still a close one, but a Quinnipiac poll released yesterday shows that Charlie Crist is leading Governor Rick Scott with 43%. And Libertarian candidate Adrian Wiley received 8% as well. UCF voters will also decide if they want Congressman John Micah to keep his seat in Washington. And there will be three amendment, amendments for students to vote on. For more on the amendments, visit our website at nightlynews.ucf.edu. If you commute to school and worry about spending money on gas, we have some good news for you. Gas prices in Orlando are at their lowest level in nearly four years. AAA representatives say the average price of a regular gallon of gas is now $3.08 in Orlando. Officials predict the average in the state of Florida will be less than $3 by next month. This will be the first time prices are this low since December 2010. Another victim is free of the deadly virus Ebola. Amber Vinson, the second nurse diagnosed in Texas, is back home in Emory Hospital released on Wednesday. Vincent held a press conference to thank her doctors and family for their support, but also to remind people the disease is still a threat. It's a day for celebration and gratitude. I ask that we not lose focus on the thousands of families who continue to labor under the burden of this disease in West Africa. World Health Organization officials say the death toll in West Africa is close to 4,500, the majority of the deaths coming from Liberia. Halloween is here and some costumes are already causing controversy. Some say people are taking certain jokes just a little too far. I looked into what's causing the stir and what UCF officials say you should avoid wearing this holiday weekend. It's up to the individual to understand that some of this may not be in the best taste and they should take care not to offend other people. With Halloween quickly approaching, many costumes are bringing negative attention. Officer Peter Stevens with the UCF Police Department advises students to think twice when deciding what to wear for the holiday. People should understand that when they dress up as a costume, for instance, Ray Rice, that may not be the best reflection on something that they should be promoting, which is anti-domestic violence. Rice, the ex-Ravens running back, is suspended indefinitely after shocking footage showing him knocking his wife unconscious surfaced on the Internet. These photos are now causing outrage online, showing people wearing Ray Rice-themed Halloween costumes next to a woman with a painted black eye. Some UCF students think this is something that comes with the crazy holiday. Well, I mean, it's wrong, but honestly, it's Halloween and people do stupid stuff all the time. But the problem does not stop there. More controversial costumes are being worn this year, including a sexy Ebola containment suit. And yet an even more shocking costume trend is that of people dressing up as terrorist group ISIS members, costumes making light of the recent attacks. And while you can't be arrested for having a bad costume, officers say they advise people to make ethical decisions when choosing their outfits. And in light of Halloween this weekend, UCF officials are giving students tips on how to stay safe. Officer Stevens advises students to dress in bright light costumes and avoid wearing anything that restricts vision or movement. He also says students should be cautious of young trick-or-treaters on the road between 5 a.m. and 9 p.m. And he stresses to avoid drinking and driving at all times. Time now for a look at our 
for a first look at our weather. Devin joins us with our first forecast. Yeah, and it's been getting a little cooler outside. Yes, that's right, guys. There's actually a cold front moving through Florida right now as we speak. So it will feel like fall tonight when you go out for your Halloween fun. It's currently 77 degrees outside and tonight that temperature will fall all the way down to 58 degrees. Humidity is at 51% and winds are moving from the northwest at about 11 miles per hour. There's also a 0% chance of rain. We'll have a little more on the forecast and your five day outlook a little later in the broadcast. Thank you, Devin. Still ahead on nightly news an airbag recall for nearly 8 million, 8 million cars is in effect this week. Find out if your car is on that list. And if you're pregnant and struggling to find parking on campus, UCF is starting a program to help you out. This week, a warning for nearly 8 million drivers in the U.S. to check their airbags. That's right. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is urging drivers to take immediate action and get their airbags checked at the nearest car dealership. And government officials say that's because the bags could explode with too much force and release sharp pieces of metal or shrapnel right into the driver's face. The problem with the Takata airbags, which are found in the world's most popular cars, including Toyota, Honda, and Mazda. Takata officials say the chances of this happening are higher in humid places, like right here in Florida. Nitsu officials first said less than 5 million cars were affected, and now they've increased it to nearly 8 million. And Senator Bill Nelson, a senior member on the Commerce Committee, says he has a zero tolerance for this. No patience for federal regulators not being entirely uh, upfront, forward-leaning, and aggressive to stop these defective products. To see if your car's year, make, and model is on the recall list, visit our website at nightlynews.ucf.edu. For the first time ever, reserved parking spots will give pregnant women access to front row parking around UCF. And our very own nightly news reporter, Katie Callahan, knows what it's like to walk around campus in her third trimester. Yes, Melissa, being a student can be stressful, but when you're 37 weeks pregnant, the simple task of walking across campus can be more difficult than you would imagine. And that's why one UCF professor is finding a solution. 
That's why Linda Walters is working on a new program to create family-friendly parking services. They are people who have told us they've had to stay home because they couldn't park close enough to their building to be able to walk when they were in their third, you know, walk to their building when they were in their third trimester. An email sent by UCF officials asked women if they would be interested in participating in a trial version of the reserved parking program. So many expectant mommies showed interest in the program that the trial is now full. Walters is hoping that the program gets accepted and that every expecting woman gets the reserved parking she needs. But some doctors believe it's more for convenience than for medical necessity. If it keeps someone in class, going to school, you know, in order to finish their semester, I think that's a very important thing. I don't think pregnancy is a disability. I don't think they can't walk. UCF parking officials say that the trial needs to prove women are using these spots during peak parking hours, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And while my doctor, who you just heard from, said the spots aren't necessary, I think it's a nice gesture for those women who have gained about 30 pounds. Back to you in the studio. Women with pregnancy parking will get to choose their spot on campus and will get a special parking tag. I know I speak for all of us here at Nightly News that we are very excited to meet baby Nora. Yes, we are. And for the first time ever, the UCF police chief is the president of a global police organization. Nightly News reporter Al Hernandez found out how the chief thinks he can help in his new position. It's kind of a chance to be on the home team and, and try to make a difference. Um, UCF Police Chief Richard Berry is now president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. He is the first IACP president to be chief of police at a university or college. Barry, a native to Central Florida, earned his master's at UCF and became the school's police chief in 2007 after serving the public for 30 years. He believes being the first IACP president from a university will make people appreciate campus police more. So as we go through this process, people, I think, um, get an understanding of how important the university policing community really is and the effect that we can have on public safety. IACP is a global organization that includes more than 100 countries and nearly 23,000 law enforcement executives. The group conducts research, implements new policies, and even testifies in front of Congress. IACP executives believe Barry brings a new perspective coming from a university. Dealing with issues that are topical and um, uh, timely with college and universities, I think is a really important thing, particularly with a university of um, UCF size. Barry officially became president at the annual IACP conference, which took place this week in Orlando. So I'm real proud uh, of that, and I think it, it's, it speaks volumes for UCF. In Orlando, Al Hernandez, UCF Nightly News. Chief Barry's term will last one year, and he can only serve once in a lifetime. When we come back, we'll take a look at this week's weather. Devin, what can we expect? Guys, you can expect some very chilly weather coming your way, but here's a live look at campus right now. It's a very crisp, very cool day, and the sun is shining, so it's a nice day to be outside. Stay tuned, and I'll tell you what to expect for Halloween tonight and for the rest of the weekend.
Government officials are helping you protect your plants against a growing threat. Nightly News photojournalist Chris Snyder took a special look into Florida's battle against the air potato. I have fought it for years. The air potato is an invasive species in Florida that is affecting native plants and local residents. Related to the yam grows in thick vines, which spread rapidly over other plants, denying them sunlight and killing them. They are a nuisance species. They will destroy other plants. Division of plant industry officials say the plant is native to Africa and Asia and was introduced to South Florida in 1905. But scientists at the Florida Department of Agriculture and DPI are trying to counteract the aggressive plants. After the USDA discovered the air potato beetle in Nepal in 2003, scientists began breeding and releasing the beetles in 2012, following extensive testing to ensure they only eat the invasive air potato. The beetles chew holes through the leaves and disrupt the photosynthesis, preventing further spread of the vines. DPI officials say the beetle is not a permanent solution, though. In three years, we released 300,000 beetles at close to 1,000 sites in almost 50 counties. It'll never eradicate air potato. It's more of control. That's why we call it biological control. So it'll just keep the vines in check to a point where it's not a nuisance anymore. I sat down with a Seminole County natural lands biologist, and she told me the beetle is already making an impact in central Florida. The entire county of Seminole is actually, there's evidence that the beetle is completely throughout the county now. In Seminole County, Chris Snyder, UCF Nightly News. Central Florida residents can now apply for their own air potato beetles for free. To find out more on how to apply, visit nightlynews.ucf.edu. If, if you're a lover of the arts, we have good news for you. Downtown Orlando now houses a brand new performing arts center. The Dr. Phillips Center for the Performing Arts will finally be open to the public November 6th. The grand opening festivities will take place throughout the weekend and will include a performance by nine-time Grammy winner Cheryl Crow. This brings Orlando citizens a wide range of performances and theater, dance, popular music, and family entertainment. UCF officials say the new center will be the home for many UCF events in the coming future. Now let's take a look at our weather. Devin has our forecast. Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our state temperature map right now. You can see that most of Florida is in the 70s with the exception of Miami right here, which is at 84 degrees. The Bay Area is at 76 and our beloved Orlando is at 79. So it'll be a nice day to go outside and enjoy the sunshine. And up north, Tallahassee and Jacksonville are both at 75. Now we'll move on to our state precipitation map. Florida will be dry today with the exception of this one storm which is pushing off the east coast right now. It won't make any landfall today so you don't have to worry about it ruining your Halloween plans. It will just go off right into the ocean. So we'll move on to our national front map. There are many fronts moving across the nation right now, but the one we want to focus on is right here, which is pushing from the north through Florida right now. And that will bring us our chilly weather we are expecting this weekend. Now we'll move on to our five day forecast. Friday isn't too bad right now. Um, it's still pretty hot. The high is 79 with a low of 58 and a 0% chance of rain. Saturday is where that cold weather is really going to hit us with a high of 61 and a low of 45 with a 0% chance of rain as well. And don't forget Sunday night at 2 p.m. The clocks will move back one hour for fall back. So you'll get an extra hour of sleep, which is always nice. And Sunday, the high is 68 with the low of 51. And Saturday and Sunday's temperatures will be record low for Florida this year so far. But Monday, those temperatures will start climbing back up to normal. Monday will be a high of 75 with a low of 61. And Tuesday will be a high of 80 with a low of 64. 0% chance of rain for those days. So it may be a chilly, week, a chilly weekend, but you can expect some cooler weather or some <laughs> warmer weather for your work week. And that's all the time we have for now. Back to Paige, Melissa, and Al at the desk. Still ahead on Nightly News, it's been an exciting week for sports. And Al is here with us at the desk to tell us what happened. That's right. The volleyball team is actually putting up a historic performance. I'll tell you more about that when we come up. Sports is up next.
Welcome back. I'm Al Hernandez, and this is your UCF Sports Update. The UCF men's tennis team is truly an international affair. They only have four players from the United States. Reporter Paige Sterner looked into the recruiting process and how so many international players ended up at UCF. 60% of the men's tennis team comes from other countries outside the United States. Of the players on the team, six of them are from Mexico, Spain, Italy, and Canada. Playing on a team with so many ethnicities brings a different dynamic than it would playing in a country like Spain. Basically in Spain it's individual. Here you come here, you cheer, you pick, it up, pick your team up, you know, and we are together. It's everything based on teamwork, you know, and being accountable for each other, you know, and working together. But how does recruiting international players differ from recruiting here in the U.S.? Assistant coach Mark McGuigan says they have to rely on international contacts in order to understand rankings in other countries. Coach Katchman and me are both Americans and we are both used to the rankings in the United States. Usually we need somebody else that we are we're used to that we know from our, from our, our past help us with the rankings from other countries and also to, uh, to get to know that kind of player, what kind of characters they are. With all of the international players on the roster, Many of them are exceeding expectations in their time at UCF. Inaki Espindola, originally from Mexico, earned Freshman of the Year in the previous season. And Spanish native Francesc Olina received a first-team all-conference award as well. When it comes to the financial aspect of recruiting players from outside the country, McGuigan says it's all the same. The same thing with an out-of-state kid. If an out-of-state kid's going to pay the same amount as an international, now a Floridian will pay uh, in-state, that would be the only difference. Overall, the team finished 12-9 and nine last season, and this year they will look to continue that same success with the spring season on the horizon. In Orlando, Paige Sterner, UCF Nightly News. The tennis team plays in the Disney tournament in Lake Buena Vista this weekend. The women's soccer team is riding its regular season success into the postseason. After defeating both East Carolina and Cincinnati 2-0, the women finished the season 15-3 and overall and an AAC best 8-1 and heading into the conference tournament. The Knights earned a first round bye and will play the winner of SMU and Temple on Sunday at 1 o'clock. The women volleyball team is continuing its role, defeating three teams at home this week. The Knights extended their win streak to 11 matches on Wednesday against USF. In the latest chapter of the war on I-4, UCF prevailed three sets to two over the Bulls. The Knights are now 18-5 and on the year and 11-0 in conference play. The players say the key to their success is the team chemistry. I've never been a part of a closer-knit team, and I've been playing volleyball for a really long time, and this year everybody just clicks. They just gel. And even if a play goes awry and it's like it's a rally, you don't have to be concerned what everyone else is going to do because you know they're putting forth 100% effort. The volleyball team hosts East Carolina tonight at 7 p.m. There wasn't a lot of action for the UCF alumni around the NFL last week. Blake Bortles had a rough game against the Dolphins. He threw two pick sixes while completing just 18 of 34 passes en route to a 27-13 loss. He finished the day with 221 yards and a touchdown. The UCF football team continued its recent success against Temple this past weekend. With the Owls in town for homecoming, Justin Holman was at his finest. First finding J.J. Wharton, who did the rest of the work himself, with a 25-yard catch and run, giving the Knights the early 7-0 lead. Holman then hit Brashad Perryman for the 54-yard score, extending UCF's lead to 24-7 in the second. Holman finished with a season-high 336 yards with two touchdowns, and most importantly, no interceptions. Running back William Stamback finished with 97 yards and a pair of touchdowns as well including this third quarter score right here, which gave the Knights their 34-14 lead. The Knights have now won their last five contests after beginning, two, after beginning 0 and 2. They head to UConn tomorrow for a noon kickoff against the 1 and 6 Huskies. That's it for sports. Now back to Melissa and Paige at the desk. Thanks, Al. As you guys can see, we're all ready for Halloween. I hope you are too. That's all the time we have for now. Thanks for joining us. And be sure to check us out online at nightlynews.ucf.edu. Join us here again next week. Now we leave you with the video of yesterday's Spooky Night 5K. 
Have a safe and happy Halloween.